Sultans of the Spreadsheet, one of Excel's most powerful and useful features for rapid data analysis is the table. So in this video lesson, we're going to launch your learning as you become table talents. Let's learn. In our previous video on sort and filter, we were working with Fortune 500 data. Now this video assumes that you are able to work with the Excel workbook that you saved at the end of the previous video. So open the sort plus filter plus table workbook now in Excel if you don't already have that open. And we'll use the data in this file to learn about another powerful Excel feature tables. And we can create an Excel table for all of our data in the Fortune 500 list. So in our Fortune 500 worksheet, let's highlight all of this data. And as a reminder, the keyboard shortcut for quickly selecting adjacent data in Excel is Shift Command and then the arrow key for the Mac or Shift Control and the arrow key in Windows. And when you use that, Excel will select all of the adjacent cells in that direction until it encounters a blank space. So I'm using a Mac. I've clicked in cell A1. Then I'll hold down Shift Command and press down arrow. This selects all of the cells vertically until it hits the last cell in my range. And while I continue to hold down Shift Command, I'm going to press the right arrow. That selects all of the cells until Excel finds an empty cell on the right. Once you've got your data selected, copy it. And now let's put this in a new worksheet. So let's click on plus in the worksheet tabs in the lower left hand corner. We'll add a worksheet and this worksheet is added just after the worksheet that we were on. So that's why it's just to the right of the Fortune 500 worksheet. And we'll paste in all of our data into our new worksheet. Let's rename this worksheet Fortune 500 table. We'll press return. And if we want to move this worksheet to the end of the current list of worksheet tabs, we can just click on the worksheet tab for Fortune 500 table, hold down the mouse, and then drag this tab all the way to the end. Let go. Worksheets rearranged. Now let's zoom to 200%, and we're ready to start working with tables. Let's also freeze panes on this data. So we'll click on cell C2. We'll head to the View tab. We'll select Freeze Panes. That freezes the row above and the two rows to the left of C2. And we'll return to the data ribbon. Now, as always, there are several ways to get things done in Excel. One way to create a table is simply to click anywhere inside of the data that will eventually be part of the table. And on the Home tab, there's this icon Format as Table. And we used this before, but just for formatting. But now we will use it to unleash the additional power of the table. So I can pull down the menu at the side of the Format as Table icon. This exposes a bunch of table formats. All of these will select the data in my worksheet and turn it into a table. And you can select any table format you'd like. We're just going to undo this in a few seconds anyway. So I'll pick this green one down here that's just three rows down in the medium table style grouping and Excel presents a format as table dialog box. Now this indicates the range for the table. There's a my table has headers checkbox that's checked. We already learned how headers work when we covered sorting in the previous video. And in the worksheet behind this box, we can see that there are marching ants around the data that will be used in the table. So we can just click OK and we've got our nicely formatted table. Now this also drops us into the table tab showing us the table ribbon, but let's undo this, go back to what we had before, and I'll show you a shortcut key to get a table set up as well. Just make sure that you've clicked anywhere inside the range that will eventually be the table, and to create the table via a shortcut on the Mac, it's Command T on Windows, press Control T, the Create Table dialog box shows up, we'll just click OK, and Excel gives us a default table format. But if you wanted to change the format, you could select a new format via the scrolling list of table view formats in the table ribbon, or you could return to the home tab and select a new format from the format as table pull down. I'm going to keep Excel's default format, so let's head back to the table tab and pull up the table ribbon. The table ribbon has lots of options to explore. You can toggle the filter buttons and the headers on and off with this checkbox. The banded rows check gives you another color in every other row. This is really useful if you're trying to keep track of data in a very large data set. So clicking this toggles the banded rows on or off. Let's keep it on. But I'd like you to click on total row. And then if we scroll to the bottom of our table, we can see that Excel has added a label total at the bottom of the table in cell A502. And it also counted up the number of rows, putting the number 500 at the bottom of the headquarters column. Now if we click on cell F502, we'd expect to see a count function in here, but instead Excel is using an advanced function named subtotal, and this isn't the friendliest function to work with. The subtotal functions inside are actually numbered, they're not named like count. So since most of the time we're just going to select the functions that we want to use in our total row via a pull down menu, we're going to ignore the actual formula that Excel enters for its calculations. So for total rows, it'll be in Excel we trust. Now to find the pull down menu with the total row functions, just click a cell in the total row, I've clicked in cell D502, that's the revenue column, and we see a small pull down menu indicator just to the lower right of this cell. So click on this arrow and we see a bunch of functions we can use in our total row. Average, count, count numbers, min, max, sum, you can even select more functions down here. So let's select average and Excel gives us the average revenue of all firms in the Fortune 500. Nice. Now what if we wanted to total up how many people are employed by all firms in the Fortune 500? So this is a quick challenge for you. Why don't you pause? 
Try this on your own. Again, you're trying to figure out what the total number of employees is for all firms in the Fortune 500. And resume. Let's see if you got it. Super easy. Just click down here in E502. At the end of the employees column, we'll select some from the pull-down. Nice! And now I want to demonstrate how the total row in Excel tables offers advantages over the calculations we were performing on filtered data in the previous video. Now in order to do this, let's take a look at a subset of the data. So let's first filter just the Fortune 500 firms that are headquartered in Massachusetts. And why don't we consider this another quick challenge since you should already know how to do this. Even though we've never filtered on a table before, filtering tables works the same way you've already learned in the previous video. Why don't you pause, give it a shot, the challenge is to filter the table so that it only shows the firms with headquarters in the state of Massachusetts. Let's resume. And all you needed to do was to click on the down pointing arrow up here in the headquarters header. This brings up the filter dialog box. You can search for Massachusetts. And as we start to type, the filter is applied and we have to scroll up to see the results. And hey, we see the Excel's total row calculation doesn't calculate the hidden rows like we showed in the previous video. And why don't we close the headquarters filter box? Instead, it applies the calculation for total rows just to the visible rows that we filtered out. That's why we see the count is 16 and we have the correct average for revenue and total employee calculations. Now we can even head back to our Just Massachusetts tab and take a look at the total employees that you calculated here. The revenue figure is different because we totaled here, but we averaged on the previous worksheet. So this is the exact same total employee value, but remember in here, the data isn't filtered on this worksheet. In the previous video, we'd filtered it on the Fortune 500 worksheet, then we copied that filtered data and pasted it into the new Just Massachusetts worksheet before performing the calculations, and that was so that we could avoid calculations calculating the hidden rows. So if we head back to the Fortune 500 table, we see the row numbers on the left and the table still hides rows, but the total row will only calculate the visible rows. Using tables seems like the way to go when we're trying to do some quick data exploration and analysis. Now, even though this is a table, we can still leverage the features we learned about in the data tab. So for example, let's clear the filter by heading to the data ribbon and clicking on the clear filter button. And now we're looking at all of the Fortune 500 rows. And if we scroll down to the bottom, we can see that the count under headquarters is 500. And we've got revised total employee and average figures that are applied to all 500 rows. Nice. Now let's use our table to explore this Fortune 500 data. And if you're learning Excel as a companion to the business and technology concepts from my information systems textbook, then you likely know that many tech markets are winner take all or winner take most. In many tech markets, there's one dominant firm that controls the space. And this is especially true when there's a firm behind a dominant standard, when that standard creates a platform that supports other products and services, when other factors are at work like network effects and switching costs. So I'd like to use the Fortune 500 data to take a look at the microprocessor market, specifically at Intel, which is the largest microprocessor firm in the world. And we're gonna compare them to AMD, also known as Advanced Micro Devices, and that's Intel's closest rival. And that's because AMD has the second largest market share of microprocessors that use the Intel standard. So we'll be filtering and comparing real industry data to underscore some points about competitive advantage, but if you're not using the IS book and you just want to follow along with the Excel topics, that's okay too. First, let's filter our table so that it only shows Intel. And you know how to do that. We can click on the little triangle in the lower right-hand corner of the name field, and this brings up the sort and filter dialog box. And in the search field, let's enter the name Intel, I-N-T-E-L. Now, let's add Advanced Micro Devices, or AMD, into this filter too. And to do that, we can click on OR, and then under Choose, we'll select Equals, and then in the pull-down menu to the right here, I can see Advanced Micro Devices. So I'll just select this. Now, I also could have typed in the name when displaying this menu, and that would have jumped me down to the close closest match to whatever I've typed in, but this will work fine. And if you scroll in this box, you'll actually see that these two firms, Intel and AMD, are checked in the list of all of these possible firms. Scrolling through this list and checking the individual firm names is just another way you could set this filter up. So with our filter set up and working, we can close this sort filter box and scroll up to take a look at our filtered data. And wow, we see a stark difference between these two firms. Intel's revenues are almost 12 times bigger than AMD's, and Intel employs about 10 times as many people. Now, I think we should also clean up this data because the industry field for Intel says technology, that's really broad. AMD's is listed as the semiconductor industry, and students in my IS book know that when someone is referring to the semiconductor industry, they're really referring to the chip business, meaning computer chips. So I think that we can improve on this data by selecting the cell containing the word semiconductor and copying it and then pasting it over Intel's technology cell. There you go, Intel. You are now in the semiconductor business, at least according to our data. And now that we've made this change, let's take a look at the entire semiconductor industry and see how Intel compares. So let's click back on our table, and then on our data ribbon, we can click on Clear. 
and we're once again looking at all 500 firms. And so now let's perform a filter on industry to take a look at all those other firms in the semiconductor industry. So I'm gonna click the arrow in the industry header to bring up the sort and filter dialog box. And down here in the search box, I'm gonna start typing in the word semiconductor. And I'm gonna stop when I get to semicon. I'm not gonna type the whole thing because look, we can see that we've got more dirty data. This is probably just a result of a poor job of coding this data by whoever contributed this data to Wikipedia, but we should not have two separate industries, semiconductor and semiconductor. They should be the same thing. So this is yet another example of dirty data. You must have constant vigilance to make sure that you are analyzing clean data so that that can give you the accurate results that you seek. Now, fortunately, just typing semicon will give us what we want. We can see that's prompted Excel to set up a filter that will show all of the industries where the industry equals either semiconductor or semiconductors. But if you were using this data in a professional setting, you definitely want to make sure that you clean the data. Always be on the lookout for data cleanliness. So now we can close this box, scroll up to the top, and we're looking at the entire chip business, the entire semiconductor industry. And we still see that Intel is by far the dominant player in the industry, at least in terms of revenues. Now the comparisons are a bit tougher to make since Qualcomm, the number two on my list, makes mostly chips for mobile phones, where Intel specializes in chips for servers, laptops, and personal computers. And most of these other manufacturers do not make Intel compatible chips like AMD does. And this industry is actually about to get even more complex because Apple's dropping Intel chips from its Mac line. Apple will no longer use Intel microprocessors. They've designed their own. Also, the firm NVIDIA that you see here, this is a company that specialized in microprocessors used in graphics processing as well as in machine learning. And they're buying ARM, ARM, a UK firm that provides the core logic standard in most chips used in smartphones, whether they're the chips provided by Apple, Samsung, Qualcomm, the mobile processors provided by all of those firms have ARM core logic inside of them. And the ARM core logic is also going into the new Mac chips. So there's a lot happening in the semiconductor industry. But this table does provide us a rough comparison to give us a sense of what it means to be the dominant microprocessor firm in the world, that's what Intel is, compared to the rest of the industry. In fact, why don't we calculate the percentage of the industry that each of these firms makes up? So why don't we click over here in G1 and we'll enter a label percent of industry. We can see that that's nicely formatted according to our table format. Thank you, Excel. And we can head down to the total field at the bottom of revenue. And let's change this from average to sum. And then let's click on the first row for the first firm in our list in its percentage of industry cell. And we'll enter this formula as equals and then the firm's revenue. So I'll click in that cell and then I'll divide by total revenues down below. Now, a few things. The formula in the formula bar is not easy to understand just by looking at it. Excel has named a range of data. The formulas also use some special syntax. And we're not going to spend a lot of time breaking apart this syntax because, well, we don't need to. As long as you remember how to select cells and then put symbols in between them to get the correct calculation, in this case, just the slash for division between our selection of firm revenue and the total revenue, when you click on an individual cell, Excel will otherwise add any needed special addressing syntax. So then let's just press return. And this is looking pretty good. Now Excel even propagated our formula down through this column and it looks like it got the addressing right. Now we'll double check this in a bit by making sure the percentage of industry column adds up to 100%, but it looks like the Excel magic already took care to make sure that there were no formula problems from unwanted relative referencing. Nice. So let's set the format in the cell that we just calculated as a percentage with a single decimal point. And I'm going to double click on the fill handle in the first cell under percentage of industry and the formats and formulas are copied down. And once again, it looks like everything is perfect. We can even double check this by totaling up our percentage of industry. And as expected, it totals to 100%. Very nice. Well, future captains of industry, I hope that you've enjoyed our foray into the waters of winner-take-all, winner-take-most competition as we learn to tangle with tables in Excel. So this lesson covered creating tables, formatting tables, using the total row, filtering and calculating table data, creating calculated columns using total row values, and moving worksheets within a workbook. Folks, the table is set for your continued excellence. Keep at it!